Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Rock Your Shine After You've Been Cracked Wide Open. Today, I have a special guest, and her name is Cheryl DeHaven, and she is the owner and founder of Wondrous Ways. Cheryl has over 20 years of experience as a trainer, working with peers in the mental health recovery field, 10 years of experience as a peer support trainer, and five years experience as a peer recovery specialist trainer. And in 2021, she became a certified life and leadership coach with the International Coaching Federation. I am excited about our story today because Cheryl has just a powerful story of resilience and courage and strength. And from her early younger years with addiction issues through some pretty serious mental health issues to where she is today and owning her own business and and training people all over the world. So Cheryl, welcome to the show this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Susan. All right. Where shall we start? Why don't we go ahead and begin with what you and I have talked about as a young person where you, you know, your parents got divorced when you were 10 years old and it seemed like that might have kick-started some things that some some things that happened after that. So, I'm going to hand the mic to you and just jump into your story. Yeah, thank you, Susan. So, yeah, so when I was 10, my parents had just divorced. You know, we had alcohol problems in the family. And, you know, hopefully, I, I guess the hope was that we removed the person that had the alcohol problem and that problem would go away. But unfortunately, it didn't stop with that person. You know, the next person had alcohol problem. And so my entire childhood was around alcohol. You're talking about the next partner that your mother was with yeah. had also oh, had, yes. had alcohol issues. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, I really sh- try to be cautious around telling other people's stories. So a little bit more generic on that part. But so I grew up in this environment where there was alcohol abuse and domestic violence. And I um, quickly, as a very young preteen, was exposed to alcohol and drugs and partook in that. And for me right away, that was great. (laughs) You know, this is took me away from my problems and things that were going on. Really sadly, I think the worst part of my, my upbringing, my childhood and my teenage years, which were the most crucial, I think (laughs) that any of us can go through is, you know, I would ended up being molested by my girlfriend's father. The family lived two doors down from me and, and it lasted for like three years. So I wasn't even 14 yet when that started. And, and no, and nobody knew this was happening. Right? Nobody knew. No, no, nobody knew. It was very hidden, everything. And it was interesting because I think there were signs that people could figure it out, but no, nobody ever said, Hey, what's going on? I think people thought it but nobody came out and said anything. And so I just looked at it as a love relationship because for me, it just, you know, having somebody care and love me when nobody else was available to do that, the people that were supposed to be there to love me and protect me and things weren't. And Where so, was your biological father in all of this when they got yeah, divorced? Did he I mean, he was living in town too, but he, he was preoccupied, yeah. right? With his own, you know, troubles and and second marriage and family and stepkids and you know things like that so there wasn't a lot of concern you know I did what I needed to do in school I really never got in much trouble even though I was using alcohol and drugs quite a lot (laughs) I would do just about anything but stick a needle in my arm that for me back then that was like the line that you would you know I wouldn't cross that Right. And but, and I, I just have to ask, because I know that your mother's also preoccupied, because I, I think what you yeah. just said is pretty powerful, that at 13 years old, you had this, your friend's dad, that to you, it was absolutely child molestation, but for you, it was attention from an adult, and you were hungry for love. And, and so I'm imagining that during this time, your mother was kind of 
not around either paying attention to your comings and goings and what you were doing. And so yeah. you were pretty much, did you Very have siblings? Occupied. There were nights. I always worked went from 16 on in high school. I got a car. I got a job. I went to school. You know, I did all these responsible things. But, you know, so nobody, yeah, no, nobody really noticed. And then I would get phone calls at work, you know, 16 years old. Don't come, don't go home tonight because somebody's drunk and, you know. What about siblings? Did you have any brothers or sisters? I have two older brothers, but they're like five and six years older than me. So they were out. They of were gone. Them. Yeah. Yeah. And they experienced some of that. They don't talk a lot about, but I mean, my seven, my oldest brother ran away when he was 17. So, you know, but yeah, so, you know, that was really, really traumatic. And I don't know how I even survived it. I mean, I guess I do because I just stayed intoxicated and nobody really noticed um, Not even the teachers at school. Were you were you drinking in school too, or did you? Oh yeah, I never went to school without being high. I mean, you know, yeah, they, yeah, they didn't. You know, and if I did get in trouble for like skipping school or leaving early or lunch or something, leaving the property, anytime I got in trouble, it was just a little thing, and you know, people were like, "Oh, she's just hanging out with the wrong people," because I was always in the higher level classes too. So people I hung around weren't even in my classes. So anyway, but I, I managed to graduate barely. I ended that relationship because for me. With the, was... with the father next door, with your friend's father. Okay. Well, okay. So now here you are, you're 18 years old. You graduated. You're, are you on your own? Did you move out? Like, tell me what's happening. And you're using pretty heavily at this point. Oh, yeah. Right? My, well, my plan was to just stay, party all summer long, and then stop and go to college and do something with my life. But when the fall came and it was time to go to school, I couldn't stop. And I didn't know I couldn't stop on my own up until that point when I started trying. And I got really depressed. So the day after I turned 18, I admitted myself into an inpatient treatment center. Yeah. Which and is incredible to me. Day. Yeah, 1983, 28 days day. And then they send you to a halfway house, which is at the, the end of town that I was not accustomed to being in. And I didn't stay there. Went back how did home. you pay for it? How did you how did you get into a treatment center and like I think I was still under my dad's because insurance. he was military somehow with the insurance or yeah. I don't I don't remember. I had insurance somehow. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, you know, right away I got peer support through the 12 steps. I got connected, right? And so that was great. You know, that was great to be around people and work walk in the same path and and working on recovery. I had a lot of you know, reoccurrences in the early years, but also I started having anxiety disorder. And this is really what, what became the worst part for me because I could not drink or do drugs and stay sober and work a 12 step program, but I was miserable with my panic disorder. So I remember having anxiety attacks and thinking, I didn't know they were anxiety attacks. I just remember feeling hyperventilating or chest pain and thinking I'm going to die, something's wrong with me and feeling like I got to get help to the emergency room or something's wrong with me. It was very scary. And of course, they would never find anything wrong with me. I did get help for therapy because after I went into treatment and they uncovered all these things that I went through as a teenager, and that's how I started telling those stories, then, you know, go to therapy. So I started doing therapy for that, to process that stuff. And, but the anxiety, when I, I went into the psychiatric hospital because the anxiety disorder was diagnosed and so bad that I didn't feel safe except for at the hospital. So they wow. put me in the psychiatric unit and that was in 1985. And back then, because I had a history of substance use, of course, they're not going to give me the hot item back then was like Valium or something. So they weren't, they would not give me that. They gave me a patch to lower my blood pressure and that was going to treat my anxiety disorder. Um, so, so I want to, I want to just stop you for a second because I know that, you know, anxiety and depression are real buzzwords now I mean it's it's an epidemic I swear with with the amount of and I think that after the pandemic we saw 
an uptick with both depression and anxiety. So when you say that you only felt safe at the hospital, you had a pretty severe anxiety yeah, disorder. Panic disorder, agoraphobia. I started learning later this word agoraphobia, like it was the fear of dying or something terrible is going to happen. And that's what it was. It was a physical anxiety attack. Like I could feel it in my body, my, you know, breathing and my lightheadedness and pains or whatever, or, you know, maybe my legs are numb. It's just weird symptoms, but it made me afraid. And so I wasn't safe in the world. I wasn't safe driving. I wasn't safe by myself. I I might die if I'm by myself. So everything I did became scary to go out to the store you know, to and, work. and that and that's what increased, right? Because you stopped the you stopped self medicating through drinking and drugs, and it sounds like your anxiety disorder continued to progress. It got so bad, you hospitalized yourself. Is that when you were discharged? When you now are agoraphobic, and for people to understand that is a that is a fear of leaving the house, where you really become like a prisoner in your own world, right? You can't go out, you can't do anything. My question is, when this happened, when you started becoming agoraphobic, was that progressive as well, where you would only go certain places and then that got more limited as well? And then were you living with your mother? Were you living alone? Where were you when this happened? Yeah, yeah. That's good questions. So no, the anxiety, the level of the agoraphobia and the anxiety disorder kind of came and went. And when I was doing therapy and medication, like antidepressants to take the edge off, or maybe even the anti-anxiety med, then I could function a little bit better, but it never went away. And, And then at times it would get so bad, it would really get bad again so I it it would come and go in you know cycles like I don't know and but inevitably from 1985 to 92 like those seven years in my 20s I'm in and out of the psychiatric hospital so trying you know to to get myself together I didn't understand it my family didn't understand how to support me yeah and and I was I was married so where was I living I got married to a man 17 years older than me at age 20 okay Um, we gotta definitely slow down because (laughs) because now I mean you're dealing were, were you still struggling with the agoraphobia at that point I mean yeah 20 that's when it all was really coming out so who, how did you meet this man that was 17 years your senior? In 12-step meetings. Oh, in the, okay. So you two get married. Okay. Yeah, we did. And I was married to him over nine years. And so, you know, so life was really hard then because my anxiety was up and down, up and down. And sometimes I could work, sometimes I couldn't. Sometimes I could go to college, sometimes I couldn't. You know, so it was really difficult in those years in and out of psychiatric hospital. He didn't know how to support me. You have responsibility. You can't just go into the hospital, you know, stuff like that. So anyway, we divorced. So he he had multiple reoccurrences and a lot of other things going on. So I left him. And yeah. And so I think I wasn't back in the hospital after that in the psychiatric hospital. But I still had occasionally some anxiety disorder. So what happened after that for me was I met a woman. I met a woman. I moved in with a friend, a friend that I knew all the way back in junior high school. And we knew each other. And so I moved in with her. She was leaving her husband. I left mine. She was pregnant. So I moved in with her. Then she came out and told me she was gay. And I said, well, I've always thought about women, blah. So we ended up being together. She was pregnant. So Nicholas was born and we stayed together for the first almost seven years of his life. So my son, yeah, we claim each other. So yeah, very much a part of his life. Then even after I left that relationship, then and and what's happening with your mental health are you healing yeah, so like that relationship too my mental health was really 
bad. My anxiety disorder, that was not a healthy relationship. It was one of the most unhealthy relationships I've ever been in. A very traumatized person. I mean, I thought I went through trauma. And, I, and uh, you know, you can't compare by any means. But anyway, yeah, a really sad experience for her. But yeah, we were together. My anxiety got a lot worse. It got to the point where I was unemployed, uninsured, and ready just to, you know, in this very unhealthy relationship. And I just wanted out. You know, there's no quality of life here. I can do therapy and medicine, and it can take the edge off for a minute, but it really doesn't help. I keep coming back to this point where I can't function. I can't draw. I can't go pick up this toddler at preschool a mile down the road because I'm having panic attacks. Or one time I lied to my best friend because I was supposed to pick up her daughter at the bus stop and I had a panic attack. So I said my car broke down. Well, then she was at work. So another friend of hers, a coworker, went to go get the child and they got in a car accident. Oh. It's like this nightmare stuff, right? It's like... I mean, these really tragic, tragic experience of my panic disorder and the shame and the lying and the, the isolation and, the, you know, everything that goes with it is the quality of life is poor, poor. But, but I am still I'm still in awe <laughs> that you did not relapse and start using. I mean, I did at first. I did. I had lots of reoccurrences. And, you know, one time I had 10 and a half years and went back out and, you know, it was pretty train wreck pretty quickly. But you no, know, for the most part, my adult life. Yeah, I have not. And, and, and that you, I mean, I can't remember if I asked you this when we talked the other day, did you have any you must have had some suicide ideation dealing with oh, yeah. at I this mean, level. I didn't want to live because the quality of life was so bad. And what prevented you? What? Like, yeah, I, I want to, that spirit of yours, because now I'm getting to know you, but what, <laughs> what kept you hanging on? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. You know, I guess at times there was hope. I was too afraid to take my life and make an attempt. So that kept me alive because if it hadn't been for that, right? And and then there were little glimpses of hope, I think, that I mean, I hear stories of people maybe getting through having some similar experiences like this and think, oh, well, maybe I can get through it. Maybe I can get through it. I'd like to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this ad. Hey guys, I want to take a minute to offer an opportunity for those of you who've been searching for a mental health therapist and haven't had any luck getting callbacks. I know it's challenging to find help, so I've partnered with BetterHelp. They are the world's largest therapy service, and they are 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's via text, chat, phone, or video call. You can message a therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you'd expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who is custom-picked for you, more scheduling flexibility at a more affordable price. Get 10% off right now on your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash rock your shine. That's better H E L P dot com forward slash rock your shine. Now back to our episode. Um, Do you have a good experience with, with, with your therapist? Did you have a, you know, somebody that you built, you know, built a trusting working relationship with during yeah. this time? Yeah, I did use therapy off and on. One of my early therapists, which was very disappointing, when I started drinking in one of my early rare occurrences, she told me I couldn't come back and see her anymore. And I thought, well, okay, doesn't seem like the right time to be cutting somebody off. 
when they're no and especially now with the work you're doing and with the population you're working with right it's kind of like <laughs> what you don't do no not farther away and but no, I had one therapist off and on, like when I was married to to my husband, and then you know a little bit off and on after that. But yeah, I mean, so in in some ways that was helpful. I mean, yeah, let's go back. Let's talk about what happened to you, and that was helpful. It gave me more understanding of what really happened <laughs> to me, and that it wasn't my fault, and all of that. So that was, that was very helpful. No, I think that for me, the, the anxiety disorder was, there was no hope that I could get better from that, you know? So that's why I was just like, I'm, I'm ready to take myself out. And I, you know, so one day I was just like, okay, I think, and I'm, I'm 36 at this point, And I'm thinking, I just, I need I'll try one more time to get help with the medication and the therapist. And so I go back to the public mental health. I go to public mental health because they'll work with me with being uninsured and unemployed. So I did that. And that's when I got connected to an organization, NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness. Then they had a, a program called In Our Own Voice. And they were looking for people to get trained in that presentation to tell their story. And so when I went to therapy appointment on the wall, a flyer was up on the wall. This is my one piece of paper story. So one piece of paper like changed my life. One piece of paper changed my life. Wow. It I've been was, going it was the breadcrumb that you had. I therapist. It was the, it, but it was the breadcrumb that you had to follow. And I, you know, well, I think mm. you heard me talk about that, that we get breadcrumbs of what is our next right move, but we have to be aware and mm -hmm. open and then we have to take action on it. Like you could have seen that piece of paper and not done anything with it, right? Sure. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it spoke to me. I was like, yeah, I want to tell my story. I know what this is like. And so when I learned to tell my story, I, I heard other people's stories and people's stories of hope and recovery with mental health. And I was like, well, where y'all been? <laughs> because for 15 years, I've been going to mental health services and no one told me that there's peer support and mental health recovery. And I went, when I went for substance use treatment, 12 step people, peer support was there. They were working there as counselors. They weren't called peer specialists, but they were in recovery. The people working there, they sent us and connected us to 12 steps right away be with your people, do recovery in the community, right? But we didn't get that when I went into psychiatric hospital, just meds and therapy, meds and therapy. And that was about it. You know, there wasn't anything more. And so, you know, I was like, wow, we've got to go tell people. <laughs> so, yeah, so I became inspired and passionate and motivated. And I was like, we got to do better. And I started connecting with other people who had the same awareness that I had and we're, we're looking for ways to improve what we're doing in the system of care, right? And so that's where I became an advocate. That's where I learned about peer support after that. And it's like, oh, now they're paying people and training people to do this work. So let's do that in Virginia, right? So now is this when through this program, when you really started to function at a whole different level like just little bitty baby steps so yeah so it's like magic I mean I think the magic of the awareness of recovery being possible was instantaneous but the ability then to take that and move myself forward through my illness through my symptoms it helped motivate me it helped motivate me and as I became more motivated and people started recognizing this is where what happened to you, right? But what's strong with you? And people started helping me recognize my strengths and my value. That made me feel more motivated and passionate and capable of doing things, right? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's sort of like that no brainer in our field that, you know, yeah. seems to get lost. But I love what you just said what's strong with you instead of what is wrong with you. Cause in trauma, we always say 
you know, instead of what's wrong with you, what happened to you. But I love, I love that. I've not heard that. Interesting. I thought it's very pre prominent in the peer support field. And when I learned about what is a strength-based approach and yeah. focus on what's strong, not what's wrong, I was like, that's it. That's it. I already know something's wrong with me. I can tell you all day long what happened to me. I've done that time and time again. I need something to help me move forward from that. That's what are the, okay, so, you know, I don't have a sense of who I am. I don't have a sense of what to do. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a blank slate right here. You know, I, I don't know. You know, I'm just lost because of all the trauma. So help me find myself. Help me give me some tools to rebuild myself, something to build myself from. You know, and if I already have something existing that's strong with me, let's build off of that, you know. And so I used to say mental health was the number one killer of self-esteem, like mental health issues, because for me, it was. Well, it's so because, you know, I'm a strength based practitioner as well. And I and and it's one of the reasons I've had such such a struggle in mental health. You know, I got my degree back in 1993. So it's 30 years later and we still use words like patient. And, you know, we've got treatment plans that imply illness and all of these. And we live in a very problem focused culture in general, right? I mean, we look at things that are wrong and, you know, horrible things are sensationalized on the news. Like we are not, we are not bombarded with hopeful stories. I mean, let's face it, we can find them. Certainly we can find them on YouTube. I mean, we can find these, but when you turn on the news, that's not typically what we hear. I mean, sometimes you'll hear a nice story, but mostly we hear about the mass shootings that are going on and the wars that are happening in, you know, throughout the world, et cetera. And I think that in mental health, it's a, a microcosm of that where the very first thing that is on an assessment is, you know, the presenting problems always. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I think that what I love so much about your story is in in that world of recovery that you were introduced to this idea of strength based work, which which back in the day, I mean, you know, back then it still was not the prevalent model. It's no. it's it still isn't today, really. And so so I just I really appreciate this perspective because now here you are, very much in this world where you are working with people that have mental health issues, but I, and, and what I really want to segue into is the work that you're doing in the prison systems, because I shared with you that that particular population is very near and dear to my heart. And, and over the years, I've done a lot of volunteer work. And if there's ever a place where we look at the most, some of the most ostracized and marginalized people are in prison, where they very seldom get a second chance, they continuously pay for the mistakes that they have made. So I would love to hear how you got into that and how your personal experience has really helped to develop this program that you're doing with these men and women in the prison. Do you work with women too, or is it the men? Is it men yes, only? It's I work men with, and women, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very fortunate to have that opportunity, and you know, I think it started back in when I started working in the field in early mid 2000s, they were hiring people as peers, but they weren't calling us peers yet. And so I started learning about the field of peer support. And I started learning that in other states, they were training in Medicaid reimbursement, you know, places where I worked were getting reimbursed for the peer services. And so I became very passionate about that and helps in, in Virginia with other peer specialists working around the state. You know, we advocated for us in Virginia to have Medicaid reimbursement, to have a training curriculum that instead of having somebody come from another state to train us with their curriculum, we created our own curriculum. So I had the opportunity to be at the table with the state and the peer leaders to kind of contribute to what this is looking with where we are right now in peer support in Virginia, where we train. We have our own curriculum. We have our own group of trainers. I became trained in 2017 with the first group of trainers. And then we were allowed to just go out and train people and kind of like be an entrepreneur if you want to, or where you work, they would allow you to train 
peers to work at the companies we were employed at. So I did that. I, I worked in a few different capacities as a peer recovery specialist and then helped shape leadership roles and coordinating and supervising peers and training peer recovery specialists until finally I decided that, you know, I could make a living off of this and go get trained as a life leadership coach. And, you know, with some some great support and encouragement from friends to do this and take these steps, I am now working for myself. And, you know, part of that process, I had the opportunity to work with people who were incarcerated in an addiction recovery program while they were in jail. And through that work, I really got to know the jail population and people struggling with mental health and substance use while they're incarcerated and, and working on their recovery while they were incarcerated. So it's like, let's, they're, they're leading each other and peer supporting each other. Let's bring the training in, you know, that we have. And so we were able to get some training in at the jail and then an opportunity came up. Virginia wanted Department of Corrections wanted to pilot the peer training in prison. And so I applied for the, you know, RFP. I, I submitted a proposal with Integration Solutions with Dr. Jackson, and we were awarded the contract to pilot doing the peer support training in a women's prison here in Virginia. And so I started to do that in person and COVID hit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, we had to take a step back. So I was able to finish that training virtually. I was able to work, I think it was, we started with six. I think we ended up with four or five who finished the peer training. And then not only do I train them, but I follow them for about six or seven months, providing them with ongoing supervision because with the prison- While they're still incarcerated or after they're discharged? Yes, while they're still incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So not only training, but I'm supervising them while they're getting their experience hours. So Department of Corrections- is amazing. They are taking the, the the individuals and hiring them, paying them top dollar, which in Virginia is 45 cents an hour. So, I mean, because in prison, you can go to, you can get culinary school and training and all kinds of different things. Well, now you can be a peer specialist and work as a peer specialist in the prison. Did, and you, so, say, did you say 45 cents an hour? Did. Yeah. And so... They, when they come into the training, they're getting paid and they're getting paid to work like up to 30 hours a week as a peer recovery specialist and get their experience hours. And I'm supervising, I'm checking them in with them every week at first for 90 minutes. Like, how's it going? What are your interactions like? What skills are you using? Have you had to handle a crisis and do the proper handoff and policies and procedures? So like we're piloting not only getting them trained, but piloting what does this look like in COVID in prison when nobody can move within prison, you know, so we were really under some extreme circumstances, but we're able to pull that off. And can then talk, I was, can you talk just, sorry to interrupt, but I just yeah. want to back you up a little bit. Can you talk more specifically about what this training is and what you're, yeah. I want to, I want to go to the, what you're, because now you're doing more of a train the trainer model, right? But Training for I'm um, training peer specialists, so they are actually like recovery coaches, is what they are. They're being trained how to support recovery of the people they're incarcerated with, right? So, I what does that look so when you're working, you have to put them through the program first, though, before they can become a trainer, right? Yeah, they're not becoming a trainer, they're just becoming a facility, a coach. A peer. Okay, I was thinking that they okay, so okay. I'm a little confused. So let's back up. So it's almost like them going to college class to okay. learn a skill or a, a think of a trade school or an apprenticeship. So they go and learn a skill and then they're going to get supervised to, you know, get their experience hours to learn and develop those skills beyond so that. So what are you teaching them? Can you get really, can you yes. get, yes, because yes. that's what I really want to hear is what are they learning? <laughs> yeah. The peer recovery specialist is a person in recovery with mental health and or substance use recovery. And the criteria is, you know, expectation that you have at least a year 
of active recovery. So you can then become trained as a peer recovery specialist. So you can take the class and that's what I teach. It's a 72 hour curriculum that we developed in Virginia. It's 60 hours in the classroom training and set 12 hours of homework assignments. So I teach 60 hours. There's 20 modules in our training manual that we go through and then I make it very interactive. So I do most of my training is virtual now in the Zoom and with them in prison, I'm very, I'm all virtual with them now. Um, so what do we so talk about when you're, when you're 60 hours? What does that look like? Is that eight hours? hours? Yeah, we do six hours a day on average. Five days a week. Yeah, we try to do as many days a week as we can. When I do it, what we have to work the schedule out with the prison. So, you know, right, it might be three days a week that we end up having them, or we might have to break it down in smaller chunks. But yeah, so, you know, if they have a lockdown or something, class can't happen. So I have to be very flexible when it comes to working with them. But I've got you know, six to 10 of them in a room and I'm on screen in this screen and I'm on screen and, you know, we can still do role plays and I can show them videos to, you know, help them understand concepts and skills. And, you know, we go through, we talk about, you know, what is it, what is a peer recovery specialist? You know, how do you, how do you use your lived experience? Because that's what we do. A peer recovery specialist uses their recovery lived experience to help somebody else role model what's possible. Oh, uh, we use a strength-based approach. <laughs> and I'm very adamant about this when I teach because I know it's so powerful. How do you create safety among the men and women that are in group together, because as I said, I've done a lot of yes. um, volunteer work, and I, I know that that is Ooh. challenging. And in prison, it's even that's more. what I mean. I'm talking specific. Yes. yes, yes, safety in the prison is really important. And when it comes to peer specialists, how am I going to trust right who I'm sharing with? So I just did these ten. And trust amongst, I'm talking about tr trust amongst the members. How do they trust each other? Yes, this is very interesting because, you know, this is the first class I've actually, well, so I had six women, then I had six women. So that was smaller and e it seemed like it was easier. But then there were still some, I noticed some, you know, things going on between the women, you know, a couple times that. So there's always usually a counselor or somebody in the room while I'm doing the supervision or the training is within proximity. They know exactly what's going on. They're providing supervision. They're, these peers are being hired under the mental health team. So their supervisor on site is, you know, the director of mental health services at that prison who is overseeing them on site. And then I'm providing them with the skills training and supervision over time to help them stay in their lane as a peer recovery specialist, because Absolutely. I know what that lane is and the, cl the clinicians don't always know what, what we do in our field. And they learn too, as they go, Yeah, yeah. as we go, or we send them tool. I like to give them a toolkit to give them up. You know, this is how you can roll out a successful program for peer recovery specialists. But let me come back your question about trust, right? So I have these 10 individuals right now in a men's prison and you know, I know some of them live on a, 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 a recovery pod, if you will, unit. So they're very much, they're more, you know, connected in that way. The other three don't. They all know each other because it's a very small community. So then when I get them in the classroom, like part of that is self-disclosure. We're going to learn how to share our stories and talk about some really difficult parts of our story. So how do we make that a safe place? How do we help people feel open and honest and trusting, right? And yeah, so I, in this most recent class that kind of unfolded in front of my eyes in terms of one person talked about suicide and having suicide thoughts out loud in front of his peers for the first time ever. And, and admittedly was nervous, you know, this is the first time I've ever said this, you know, to, so they are just 
they are trusting. They are, are when they by the time they get into the training class, they already have recovery time under their belt. They've already made that U-turn moment in their life where they're motivated and they have very good coping skills and strategies and things that they're doing. So when we put them together, they're they're like very like-minded in that way. So we we set learning agreements, comfort agreements in the classroom. And then when it comes to sharing, I set boundaries. We use a trauma-informed approach and make sure that we're keeping things in boundaries so that people aren't over disclosing. But it, you know, for one individual out of 10 to say, I know what it's like to live with schizophrenia and to hear voices. And this is what helps and this is what doesn't help from somebody trying to support me right have you heard has this changed the atmosphere i mean how is this what have you like i i just i want to hear some of these stories where have you heard because i'm sure not all of these people are getting out right some of them probably are doing life or maybe they're not i don't know like how long yeah. Like, well, what are their kind of, sentences? Are they all over the map? Yeah. Well, they, you know, DOC wants the peer support to be available in the prison. So, you know, they were really looking at people who had some time ahead of them yeah. to be okay. there. Right. So, but I have worked where I know at least one individual who had been released right after I finished training. And I, I always make myself available to these folks when they get out and say, hey, if you get stuck out there, you've got my email address. I will be happy to point you in the right direction to find employment, to find internship opportunities, whatever I can do to help support you in your professional role to become a peer specialist and do this work. So, well, you know, constantly just linking them with other people when they get out. So, you know, you have all these people leaving the prison that are unaware that peer support even exists in the community and how vast it is out here right now. And they don't know when they walk out the door that there's warm lines available that they could call and just get free peer support over the phone, not crisis support, but just talk to a person in recovery with mental health or substance use and get support or resources or tell them something happy about your life to celebrate, you know? So we, you know, or, oh, maybe your insurance company, Medicaid pays in some of these insurance companies have peer support on staff. So check with your Medicaid policy. Probation and parole. Many of the probation and parole offices in the community in Virginia have peer support specialists on staff. Wow, so that's incredible. They might return to a community where there's a peer specialist to support them in probation and parole, where there's a peer specialist peer center or recovery community organization, a drop-in center, recovery housing, all these things that exist with this all this growing field of peer recovery that's out here. I, it, it's like music to my ears because I know that one thing that you know, the recidivism rates in prison, you know, were quite high back when I was doing volunteer work. This was many, many years ago. And we've done a lot of work. It's called the Maine Model of Corrections now in the state of Maine. And like our commissioner, Randall Liberty, has done just so much amazing work. And with our, you know, with our corrections in the state and so much opportunity now for these men and women that didn't exist before. And I think it's incredible. And I also think, you know, that there's also a big hole typically in a lot of states around that that transition, right? Coming out of prison and back into the community and getting jobs. We also have something here called Maine Works where, you know, ex felons or people coming out of the prison system. There, a woman, her name was Margot Walsh, she started this company about 10 years ago and really helped these men become employed you know, with carpentry, things like that, skilled labor. And so I'm just interested to know, so you're doing this peer recovery. It sounds like there's supports when they get out into the community. Do you also have connections with organizations where you can help, where there's, you know, they can help these men and women get jobs after they get released? Yeah. So actually VADOC, 
Virginia Department of Corrections hires and contracts with peer recovery specialists in Virginia. And they do not do a background check that I'm aware of. So they will hire them then to work in probation and parole and different you know, aspects of criminal justice for the Department of Corrections. So they are providing job opportunities as well, which is huge. Yeah. And, you know, as as you're talking about the, the other program and ex-felons and things like that, just one of the things that we teach them in the training is multiple pathways to recovery is one concept, like 12 steps is not the only way, right? There's many strength-based approach or, you know, other types of support groups, you know, NAMI or peer support lines. There's just multiple ways and not everybody's into therapy. So if that's not you, then what else? How else can you use your community? So I look at, I take the eight dimensions of wellness And how does that apply in your setting in prison? You can still work on the eight dimensions of wellness because you can still practice spirituality. How are you making your environment? How can you thrive in your environment? And so I took the eight dimensions of wellness and I had people that I work with in jail and in prison contribute ideas in each column, what they do to support that area while they're incarcerated. That's incredible. And so to do peer support is not just about getting people into recovery. We meet people wherever they are. If they're not interested in recovery or they want to focus on getting a job, then how can I help you in our community inside these walls get a job? What do you want to do? What what are resources that are available to you? What's, you know, what have you thought about? You know, so coaching and peer supporting people, you know, this is what I do. This is how I did it. You know, and have so you now- heard where, where I was going with this earlier? Have you heard about the ripple effect? Like, has this impacted the atmosphere and the environment with inside the prison with having these men and these women that have gone through this and working with their peers? Have you have there been any anecdotal stories that you've heard? Yeah, yeah that's a very good question. I think, you know, they're really making opportunities for people to there the the peers that I'm teaching are very passionate about this work and they're trying to get it in there any way that they can to all these different individuals they feel the power and the motivation of what peer support can do right and so so they're very ambitious and creative so you know they they are talking about you know they're bringing peers in when somebody is in suicide watch to sit with them while they're in suicide watch and to start building that relationship, you know, and use a strength-based approach or offer some help, you know, rem- or oh, I've been in suicide watch too. I know exactly, yeah, I don't know exactly what, um, you know. So, and then with segregation, you know, when people are isolated, they are also looking at opportunities just to sit outside the door and have a conversation with somebody if they will allow that with peer support. And so they're very open to, you know, all the possibilities in Virginia to creating ways the peers can connect with people who want to do something different or want to participate in this. And in your and in your understanding, is this a progressive model that has taken root in other states to your knowledge? Yes. I know Virginia has looked at other states and what they're doing in the prison with peer support. And they've had, you know, other states that are doing it without even having the peers actually trained, you know? So yeah, Virginia is very, loves the role of the peer and the value of the peer. And so they're really supporting that effort, anything that you can do, but it is a culture change. You know, it's shifting the the mindset of the people, right? Constantly being, you're a prisoner, you're, you know, you did horrible things and that's why you're here, you know. It's and, mo- always- and so many of them, a large portion. I mean, I can't say 100%, but I'm going to say, I mean, and, and just for listeners, I mean, I'm making this number up, but just from my own work and, and knowing people who work in the field, a very high percentage of people who end up in the adult facilities have had severe trauma. Many oh. of them deal with 
you know, some have learning disabilities, right? I mean, there's, a, they, they have a whole host of different things that have never been dealt with, or, you know, abuse, domestic violence, drug and alcohol abuse, addictions, all of these things. And it's, I mean, I think that we've come, it sounds like we've come a long way in the prison system, certainly since I was volunteering in them, but that it, it typically was not a place where they could heal or get the kind of healing that they need that put them in there in the first place. And so this program that you're talking about just fills me with so much hope, which is why I wanted you on, because you've got this incredible journey of yourself and your own strength and resilience. And I always think about it sort of like paying it forward, that now you're in this field. So you understand it from both sides, from a very personal side. You also have the element of hope that, hey, look at me. It, it's true. There is hope out there. Things can really change. And now working, as I said, with some of, you know, I, I call, you know, residents or people in prison, some of the most vulnerable population, just given the atmosphere that they're living in and the way that they need to survive. And in many of these prisons, right, they they have their gangs, right, because they're all, they're all, it's a microcosm, right, of what they were living in in the macro. So, yes, I just think it's yes. incredible. It's amazing. It, it's amazing. The you know, I I tell them, okay, I didn't even know what a strength based approach was, but you know, so what are some strengths? So your homework assignment is to focus on a strength, and you get bonus points if you think of, think of a strength for somebody who's kind of rubbed you the wrong way, <laughs> you know, or that you're having struggles with, and so they'll come back and they'll be like, oh yeah. You know, so they learn so much about these skills and strategies and recovery based language and person first language and all these approaches that are not deficit based, that focus on, you know, this and they are motivated, they are excited, they are, I, I tell them, you're the experts. I need you all to tell me what you think this needs to look like in your community. I'm not in your community. Right. Right. And the narratives, right? I mean, we see this in mental health that people who have been in the system for a long time usually come with a whole host of diagnoses, right? I mean, three or four or five different diagnoses. And so they come with a narrative around who they are based on their labels of who they are. And of course, take that to a whole new level where you're in the prison system, your narrative is not a pretty one, right? It's all of the ways that you have messed up in your life, all of the ways that you're a screw up, all of the things that you have been told you're going to, you know, you know, you're not going to amount to anything, you know, etc. And here comes in this like, whoosh of fresh air, <laughs> like just yeah. this, you know, just this new way of looking at life that not only have they never heard about, but have never even thought to think about what is right with them. What is, you know, yes. what, what gifts and beauty do they bring to the world? Because yes. they were born into their circumstances. And I understand that we all have to take accountability, but we also need people that are there to hold up the mirror, to show us a different side of our narrative. We all have a narrative about who we are. All of us do. Yes. Show me how to change the story, my story, my yeah. ending. Yeah. So giving them the tools and the strategies to now take that, their hard story and change it into a story that has meaning and purpose when they feel motivated and they want to support other people. And they really are. I mean, I can witness the change in them. I mean, it just is phenomenal in that little bit of time that how it's impacting them, how it's impacting the culture, and then, you know, and, and, and impacting the people who work there, too. They're witnessing this change in people and, and how our strategies and professionalism, even though non-clinical, are very powerful and effective. And so we can kind of help take the edge off. And in prison, that's pretty important, you know, to be it, able to take that. Job. It's very important. And I think that, you know, just listening to you and watch you and your enthusiasm and your own passion, it's just, you know, I, I love these stories that come full circle and that sort of defy, you know, what people believe to be 
to be possible. And oh my gosh. And I just like looking at you, it's just like, like what I you live I love through. these folks and I can't look at it through the lens of, oh, I wonder what they're in there for. Well, some of them revealed that when they shared their stories, right? And it's very intense and yeah, and very. but I also recognize that they've been impacted by tr very traumatic experiences, you know, and that are, you know, not different than many people. You know, they just ended up there in a bad, you know, they had a bad moment in their life that took them there. And yeah, people need to be accountable, but people still deserve humanity and, you know, 100 percent and the opportunity to connect with other people in the human spirit and to thrive. Right. And yeah, I, it blows me away. Anytime I, I witness people thriving and living their best life and they're incarcerated. I know just, it's incredible. I'm, blown right? away. I'm just like, I'm blown away. I know. And, you know, I remember this one story I think that you'll really appreciate I was teaching a therapeutic writing program to kids that were incarcerated in the juvenile justice facility. And these kids had crazy trauma. And some of these kids, you know, will end up in the adult facility. And I'm very aware of that. And they've got parents in the in, in the adult facility. Yes. And so I was teaching, of course, it was a strength-based therapeutic writing program. And I was teaching from positive psychology, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. And so within positive psychology, I was teaching this one writing exercise where it's beautiful. I've used it in leadership trainings. I've used it in, in a lot of different venues. But I, with the kids, it was very interesting because you have them write an introductory story of when they were at their best, and it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. And if you ask somebody to come up with a time that they were traumatized or something, they they can they can we, all of us can we can think of all of these times, right? These horrific events that have happened in our life. But when you say think of a time when you were at your best, it really puzzles people they have to really run off and give it some thought so you can imagine kids at a juvie center how difficult this was for them so they all came back the next week and they had each had written a story and all of the stories of when they were at their best there was a trauma embedded in the story because mm. this was their life but this one particular story that has stayed with me all of these years was a young woman you know, she was a young adult. I think she was 18. She was getting out when she was 21, I think. And she had written a story of when she was at her best. And it was when her uncle shot her aunt. She was living with her aunt and uncle because her, both of her parents were also incarcerated. She was living with her aunt and uncle. Her uncle shot her aunt. And she was had, and this is when she was at her best, when she was holding her aunt and holding her head and trying to stop the bleeding in her, I'm going to cry. Her aunt died in her arms. And she said, I never knew I was that strong. And I think that what happened for me in these stories, I, I've always believed in the strength and the resilience of the human spirit. But to have these kids read these stories of just horrific trauma that for me, yeah. can't even begin to understand, but oh how they God. saw the strength within themselves in these horrific situations. It was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful exercise because people get to have the opportunity to think about when they felt like they were at their best. But what happens when they read it aloud is you have everybody in the room listen for the strengths that they hear in the story. And yes, they, that's what we do in the class. Very powerful. Yes. We do story share day and they have seven or 10 minutes to tell their story really about the recovery and hope. It's like, we're trying to craft that story, the strength based story and things like that. But they talk about the hard stuff too. And at the end, everybody's story, we all have to say one thing that was strong and one thing we related to like that, the please. most beautiful, but to hear those stories to know where they are, how they got there, and then to see them so full of hope and compassion and empathy and willingness and, you know, thriving and making the most of coming up with ideas on how to implement the program and reach the most people and do the most good. And 
It, it's unbelievable. And I get to go visit them week after week after week to watch them, you know, flourish on journey, right? Yes. It's it's amazing. Well, yeah. and you and you infuse them with your own, you know, sense of joy and hope and belief in them. And you also, I mean, I love the name of your com- company, Wondrous Wonders. Yes. It's such a Wonder- beautiful- yeah. How did you come up with the name of that? Of yeah. Company? Wonders Ways. Stay curious. Curiosity became very important to me in, in learning to look at things differently and try on other perspectives. Right? It removes judgment, right? Judgment. It, judgment is really, it, exactly. judgment is what levels all of us. Yes. We, yeah. Yes. Just stay curious. And so I use that in my own struggles and I use that, you know, in my business i'm like let's just see what we can learn you know what can we do what can now we can how can we make this better so curiosity and and so wondrous ways there were too many businesses with curious and curiosity so then wondrous came into mind and then ways because i really do believe that everybody has their own way i cannot define anybody else's way nor can anyone define my way right right i have to figure that out but we can support um, each other as they find their way. Oh my goodness. And without judgment. <laughs> and without judgment. Oh, that's yes. why that's why I love storytelling so much. It allows us to connect in a whole different way because really, I, you know, that beautiful saying to know my heart is to know yours. Cheryl, I have to like wind us down. I'm looking at the time. Let me, I get two Forever. questions. Well, first of all, where can yeah. people find you? I don't know if you're on social media. Yeah, you- wonders. Yeah, well, um, how do people find me? Wondersways.com on my landing page. You can reach me through that, wondersways.com, www.wondersways.com. And then Coach Cheryl. Excellent. At wondersways.com. And you take on clients? Are you actively? Life and leadership coaching. I do group coaching. I love people working in behavioral health in particular, because I know our passions are the same. But then how do we take care of ourselves and show up for ourselves and integrate work life and all that, the glory and and be a good trauma steward at the same time. So I really love coaching around that. Wonderful. Okay, so I've got two questions. One is what does self mean to you? What does self love mean to you oh self-love means self-compassion self-compassion which is the removal of judgment just so everyone really yeah. realizes. Thank you. and then finish this sentence for me hope is hope is that anyone who suffers right or gets cracked wide open can then find a connection to help them I, I, you know, I, I keep going back to the, yeah, hope is finding healing through that, through the cracks, right? And and so my hope is that other people can find that, you know, I have loved ones who suffer and have suffered and, and I just want them to be able to heal and grow and people we know are going to suffer. So how can we help each other heal through that suffering? Hope is finding healing through the cracks is so beautiful. I just love that. Cheryl, yeah. thank you so much for joining me today. I have I have really enjoyed this conversation and you have me just thinking about a lot of the memories that I have of the people that I worked with in, in the prison system. And so thank you for bringing your own, your story and your yourself but also your just your love and your belief in healing right because we all everybody has what it takes to heal they really do yeah it's unbelievable i i I think i do really believe it just takes one person to believe in you yeah is there anything else you want to say to our listeners before we end no i i just you know just lead with compassion, lead with compassion, you know, try that lens on when, when you're feeling stuck. Yeah. And and stay curious. Yes. When you start to judge yourself, move outside of it and be curious 
How are you feeling? What are you experiencing? And what is that telling you? What new thing are you learning about yourself in this experience? And that curiosity, I remember in graduate school, I'll never forget it when one of my professors said, when you stay curious, you can get out of your own way. And it has served me oh, throughout my work. Great. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah. 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 So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Little listeners. things. I'm like, some why why don't we teach us in school? <laughs> I know. Right. I know. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here. And I want to thank all my listeners for tuning in. Yes, thank and you as for you, me. you oh God, it was a pleasure. Yeah. And I hope someone, our listeners somewhere out there needed to hear this conversation today. So I love you all and we'll see you guys here next week. Bye for now.